It's day 46 of isolation and I've kind of had enough of it and this is where I live now. Um, these guys have said I can use their lab which is very helpful because we've got, we've got a whiteboard over here so if we need to if we need to draw anything, we can draw stuff, and we got we get a pet doggy. Oh, what did you do? Are you a good boy? Are you a are you a good boy? Cause you're a good boy. You're a very good boy. Right. Um, but more importantly, because today I thought we'd talk about the sternum, because we talked about the superior thoracic aperture recently. They've got some pretty good blue um, human body stuff. So. If we're going to have a look at the sternum, <laughs> that's so cool. So if we're going to have a look at the sternum, we'll talk about the thoracic cage, the roles of the thoracic cage. Can I rotate this? No. Um, and the role of the sternum within it, the things that attach to it, and the fact that the sternum's actually got three parts and how they join together. Graphics out here are pretty good though. Oh god, I miss going outdoors. Um, okay, so the thoracic cage, the sternum plays a significant role in the structure of the thoracic cage. So what does the thoracic cage do? Well, it's made up of the sternum and the ribs and the vertebrae and some other tissues. You've got the the uh, the costal cartilages, you've got the intervertebral discs and other bits and bobs. So I guess uh, the first function that everybody goes to is protection. So the thoracic cage protects all those soft and vital organs inside the thorax, um, the heart, the lungs, that sort of thing. But probably more day to day than that, the thoracic cage with the muscles of the thoracic wall form a pressure barrel. So this, this barrel resists the changes in pressures that occur when you move your diaphragm up and down to change the volume inside the thorax and draw air into your lungs so that you can breathe. And it also moves, doesn't it? So you can move your sternum in the pump handle and you can move your ribs in the bucket handle movement to um, also change the volume inside the thoracic cage, decrease the pressure, draw air in or vice versa and push air out. And we talked about that in one of the very first videos I ever made, which I did while cycling. So the thoracic cage does all that. So it has to be rigid yet flexible because it has to move. That explains all the joints and the bits and the components, I guess. Uh, and that's an, important com that's an important reason why the sternum is as it is and does what it does. But the other thing that happens with the thoracic cage is the upper limbs are suspended from the thoracic cage and the musculature for the upper limbs is su suspended from the thoracic cage and things like that, right? And the sternum is the only bony anchoring point for the clavicle. So the clavicle, the scapula, um, those are the shoulder girdle and attached to the humerus, right? So that's another function of the sternum. <laughs> the ants have come out. <laughs> so where is the sternum? So it's in the center of the thorax. But more importantly, if we think about what's nearby, it's, it's anterior to the mediastinum, or anterior to the mediastinum, however you want to say. Um, so it's, it's largely anterior to the heart, but it's also anterior to those mediastinal structures. So we've got the great vessels coming out and that sort of thing, haven't we? Um, it's also uh, forming part of the superior thoracic aperture, which is probably why the sternum made it into my to-do list, because we talked about the superior thoracic aperture a little while ago, didn't we? And we have this surface anatomy landmark here, which gets called the jugular notch, or the suprasternal notch, or sometimes just the sternal notch. And that, uh, and that is the superior part of the sternum and the two clavicles joining to it. So the sternum has three parts. We talk about the sternum as, as a single thing, but the sternum has the manubrium, a body, and the xiphoid process. So the manubrium is the superior most part, it's the widest part, and it's the manubrium that the clavicles join to. So that would be the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, a synovial joint that's held together really tightly by tough ligaments, a really, really tough joint. Manubrium, right, so the sternum comes from uh, the Greek word for 
essentially sternum, <laughs> chest, sternon. Um, but there are lots of uh, there are lots of sword related words associated with like, manubrium, manu, hand. So the manubrium is considered the handle of the sword, and the body of the sternum we call the body of the sternum. But it also gets called the gladiolus from the Latin gladius. You know the gladius, the short sword. So this is the manubrium is like the handle to the short sword, like this. Ziphoid also means like sword, but Greek. So lots of sword related stuff going on in the sternum, which I guess kind of makes sense. And also the first rib is joining here. Now this is a synchondrosis. So this is a cartilaginous joint between the first rib and the manubrium. Um, and if you are working clinically, this is why it's very difficult to count ribs by starting from the first rib because the first rib it's kind of difficult to palpate because it gets hidden by the clavicle. Much better to start from the sternal angle which is where we find the second rib. So what's the sternal angle? You can palpate it right so start from in manubrium work your way down and you can feel this ridge here that's the sternal angle. The reason it occurs is because the the manubrium and the body of the sternum aren't flat they kind of they make an angle like that and it's that joint, the manubrio-sternal joint that you can feel as the sternal angle which also gets called the angle of Louis um, and we have a, a, a section, a transverse section of the angle of Louis where a whole bunch, bunch of interesting structures exist and there's another video on that somewhere else um, and a bit of interesting history as well because Louis was involved in inventing the guillotine and transverse sections and ooh, anyway so that's the sternal angle and the body of the sternum then so in me it's a complete bone it's it's a bit ridgy so the bone the body of the sternum originally forms as as like four separate bones surrounded by cartilage and then as ossification progresses it becomes a, a single bone but that leads to then a bone that's often kind of a little bit ridged so in younger people um, it's more cartilaginary and then as you go through adolescence it gets it gets ossified so it becomes fully bone and that might not complete until you're in, in, in until you're in your 20s so if the first rib uh, meets the manubrium the second rib so if you find the sternal angle move out laterally from there there's your second rib and then you can count the other ribs from there and the intercostal spaces you start at the sternal angle start at the second rib and then count down um, so ribs two three four five six and seven their costal cartilages meet they join the sternum again as synchondroses and then the remaining ribs eight nine and ten because eleven and twelve are floating right the ribs of eight nine and ten their cartilages come together to form that that costal margin which comes up to join with the cartilage of the seventh rib and join into the body of the sternum as the xiphoid process hangs off it. So the xiphoid process is the last part of the uh, sternum and it's a little bit flexible and it's not terribly nice to poke. Okay, a bit about joints because I used to be a cartilage biologist. So the costochondral joint is the joint between the bony rib and the cartilage bit that runs from the bony rib to the sternum. So the costochondral joint is the joint between the bone of the rib and the chondral cartilage. Um, this is a synchondrosis. So this is a joint where there isn't any movement. Essentially you can think of the cartilage as a continuation of the bone. Cartilage is a little bit more flexible than bone though. Uh, now where the... 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 <laughs> Now where the cartilages of ribs 2 to 7 meet the body of the sternum, those are synovial joints between the cartilage and the bone of the sternum. So the synovial joint, just like synovial joints elsewhere in the body, um, permit um, a degree of movement, which is what we were talking about with the flexibility um, and yet supportive nature of the thorax. The first rib is different, the first, and the first rib is different, it's a weird rib, um, but the first rib where it joins the manubrium, as I said, that's a synchondrosis, that's a cartilaginous joint, so the idea is there shouldn't be a lot of movement there. The last part of the sternum then is the xiphoid process from the Greek word 
Oid Eidos shaped, Ziphoid meaning sword shaped, but to be honest, they can be all sorts of shapes. It's quite variable. And uh, the Ziphoid process is, is cartilaginous in probably you guys. Don't entirely know who my audience is, but you guys. It doesn't really start to ossify or get fully ossified until you're about my age, in your, in your 40s. Um, and then the joint between the body of the sternum and the Ziphoid process, so the Ziphosternal joint, is again a synchondrosis, it's a cartilaginous joint, the idea is there shouldn't be a great deal of movement there, and that can also ossify as you get older. I've got a bit of flexibility still in mine. Um, surface anatomy wise, you've got the chondral margins there, so you've got the subcostal angle, where those two margins meet. Oh, I really doesn't like being poked. And this is quite a good um, landmark. So um, this is about the level of the T10 vertebra. Um, the, the xiphoid process is at the base of the heart. This is where the central tendon of the diaphragm is anchored. This is where the fundus of the uterus will reach to by about, what, 36 weeks? It's just a really good surface anatomy landmark, you know, and of course we're obviously very clearly going from thorax to abdomen at this point. <sighs> and that's it, that's the sternum. Um, three parts. That's how the ribs attach, how the clavicles attach, and a little bit of uh, surface anatomy. Um, I wanted to do a simple one this week, because I'm a bit tired. <laughs> I'm a bit worn out after all this time at home, but you've got two options, haven't you? You either keep going or you give up. And I'm sure you guys are feeling very similar. So just keep going, keep going, just keep going. Um, all right, Whew, see you guys <laughs> next week. Uh...